gravity um, is, is very different from all other forces in nature and that the fundamental degrees of, of gravity are not local. Gravity is a, is a so-called holographic theory. I think string theory has put that particular conceptual idea on a much firmer footing. So welcome everyone to the uh, new episode of the Dialogues on the Foundations, uh, which is an initiative of the Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Munich. Uh, in the context of a so-called research focus on new foundations for physics. And um, it's my pleasure to have today Jan de Boer, uh, and uh, he's a professor at the University of Amsterdam, but I let you introduce uh, yourself. Yes, hi, thanks, Daniel. Yes, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jan de Boer. I, uh, as you already said, I'm a professor in uh, theoretical physics at the University of Amsterdam. I've been here now for a bit more than 20 years. Uh, and my interests in principle are quite broad. I, I just like science, uh, but I was trained uh, in theoretical physics and the methods that I use are those of theoretical physics. So I mostly consider myself a theoretical physicist. And then within theoretical physics, uh, I mostly have an interest in uh, quantum physics, uh, a little bit like condensed matter physics, uh, but mostly questions in uh, like more foundational questions that have to do with the nature of space, the nature of time, uh, how do you combine uh, gravity and quantum physics and, and those sorts of things. But in principle, I, I preferably think, you know, like to think of myself as a theorist more than anything else. Very good. And uh, I am myself a theoretical physicist uh, with uh, mostly working on quantum gravity and foundations of physics, uh, a, a bit like uh, Jan, and uh, with side uh, but active interest in uh, philosophy as well, uh, philosophy of science. And I work at the Arnold Sommerfeld Center for Theoretical Physics here at the University of uh, Munich. And something you didn't say, Jan, so I will say it, is that uh, you also work uh, uh, a lot and in particular on, on string theory, uh, uh, which indeed captures all the other topics you, you mentioned. So shall we start from there? I mean, what, what, does, what is all that about? What does it have to do with uh, nature of space and time and quantum physics and all the rest? Yeah, well, one of the, you know, important questions in uh, theoretical physics uh, is in some sense a reductionist approach, if you want to phrase it in a slightly philosophical language, where we try to maybe find one equation or one thing that combines everything that we see in the universe in one single uh, equation. We have successfully done so for most of what we see in the universe. There's a very beautiful series called the standard model, and basically describes all the particles that we see around us, all the matter that we see around us. Uh, describes the interactions between these things. It describes, for example, why if I drop my pen on the table, why the pen does not go through the table, but stays on the table. Um, and many other things that, that you're familiar with are all explained by the standard model. Uh, however, one thing that turns out to be complicated is to incorporate gravity, which is another thing we're very familiar with uh, in, in this theory of particles. Uh, and therefore how we sort of combine these two things in the, in, if you wish, in a single equation. Uh, well, maybe we don't necessarily need like a single equation, but at least to combine them in something that uh, allows us to make predictions and that is consistent, uh, has been a major challenge in theoretical physics for the last couple of, uh, you know, uh, well, not, I would say, but maybe the uh, last 40, 50 years or so. Uh, even Einstein spent quite a bit of time especially towards the end of his life, pondering this question. Uh, uh, it's still today an active field of research. So for you, uh, quantum gravity, the problem of the quantum nature of the gravitational field and therefore space and time, because generativity taught us that uh, they are the same thing or very closely related, that that's your main uh, motivation or uh, interest in, uh, in, in, in string theory, if, if I understand correctly. Yeah, string theory is an attempt to precisely come up with equations that combine, uh, you know, the physics of particles, uh, electricity, magnetism, all those things with, with gravity as we know it. Mm -hmm. uh, and string theory 
provides a nice set of consistent equations that combine in a, in, in a consistent way uh, all those forces. Yeah, and uh, can I you, in a, let me maybe add like it's in they string theory combines all those forces in a uh, yeah consistent way. So it's a conceptual uh, framework in which you can combine all these forces together in in a single equation if you want. Yeah, in fact, if I, if I can add something, it's a uh, this much more to that, not only because there are many consequences for all, all what you said, and, and it's highly non-trivial uh, even if it were just that. But uh, for, for a second reason that I think is useful to emphasize, every physicist I know struggles to unify things. So all of them. Now, at the bare minimum, this shared attitude uh, means uh, that, as you said, people try to bring into a single mathematical framework uh, a broader range of phenomena that initially were considered, uh, you know, not captured by a single model. And, you know, now we try a unique, uh, uh, to develop a unique framework. But string theory does more than that. Uh, the, the extra bit is a bit less shared in the sense that people may have different attitudes, but uh, string theory does something which is uh, even more remarkable, certainly, uh, which is that it not only unifies in a single framework, but to some extent unifies in, the, in a single set of entities. Yeah. Like, you know, what looks like gravity on in some cases uh, is in fact secretly the same thing that looks like uh, a, a totally different force, like the nuclear force in a different situation. It's not just the framework, but it's in fact the entities which are unified. And yeah, it all comes from this basic rudimentary building block of the string. Um, now these strings, they are very tiny little loops. They are super small, so we have not actually seen a string in the universe, like a string in the sense that I'm just describing now. Uh, so we have not seen a string, uh, but the fact that uh, all the basic building blocks in our universe, all the particles that we know, uh, photons and all kinds, you know, the forces of nature, that everything is supposed to come from a small tiny loop rather than from a point uh, there seems to be an important conceptual thing and uh, it is remarkable that if you have a very tiny like a, if you have a point the point doesn't have a lot of structure right the point is just a point now we can still give some structure to a point we could like give it a bit of charge but there's not so much structure that you can give to a point uh, but to, to a little loop we can give a lot of structure because we can let it move in all kinds of different ways and, and in some sense, all these different ways in which this little loop can move or vibrate uh, manifest themselves in our world as different particle-like things. Because we don't see the string, we just see it from a larger distance. And, and to our eye, all these different little moving strings, they actually look like different entities and different particles. And those are the building blocks of uh, DC. Very good. Let, let, let me add then another, a, a different way of understanding, uh, not so much string theory that I leave it to you, but uh, th this difference between uh, unifying in terms of having a single framework and unifying in terms of having a single type of object, uh, a single type uh, of entity. I mean, general relativity uh, as a classical theory, is a unified framework for everything uh, in principle. I mean, then we know it doesn't work. We know that we need quantum mechanics to, to describe phenomena at the micro scale. But if they just gave us the theory, uh, it could be in principle a unified theory of the world. I mean, there is a single set of equations, uh, but you have to introduce different type of things, uh, matter fields, uh, the gravitational field. Uh, then there is a single set of equations that tells how they interact, how one's in, one influences the other, but it's different entities. Uh, string theory does something more. I mean, it's a, it's a single set of equations, but there is, as you said, one type of object, and depending on how it vibrates, in fact, how it moves, uh, uh, the type of behavior it has, then from a distance, so to speak, or, uh, you know, with some farther approximation, it would look like uh, a photon, it would look like, uh, you know, a gravitational uh, field, it would look like a quark, uh, and, and, and so on. I mean, any other aspect of the world in principle is there. And I agree. Uh, on the other hand, there's also um, something that, that is still to be chosen in, in string theory, as you say. Um, for example, let's talk briefly about the standard model of physics. So this is the theory that describes all the fundamental particles that we uh, naively think exist. 
like uh, quarks and electrons and these things. Uh, so that's given by one long equation, but it has many different objects in it, because there's like one object describes an electron, another object in the equation describes a quark, there's yet another object that describes a photon, etc., etc. Uh, so there's some equation that has many building blocks, and all these things describe different ingredients. So all these different fundamental constituents, they don't come from a single thing. They are all different parts of the equation. In string theory, all these different things, all these different particles, they do not come from different pieces in the equation. They all come from exactly the same thing, from the same underlying string. So in that sense, it's very different. On the other hand, if you want to make an, uh, a more precise description of our universe in string theory, uh, you still need to make choices because it's, there's no unique string theory. Uh, although the object is sort of unique, you can still let it vibrate in all kinds of different ways and manners, and there's still choices to be made. So in that sense, you could also say it, it's, it's kind of a framework because it's uh, still all, all kinds of different possibilities. So it's not like, you know, you might think this ultimate dream is that there's this one equation and it's completely unique. It has no freedom of whatsoever. There's just this one equation and it exactly describes our universe. Uh, now that's, I think, also an interesting philosophical question, namely, is, is, is our universe in some sense theoretically unique or not from a purely theoretical point of view? Or could we contemplate other universes that are equally viable, that just have other properties? Mm -hmm. And we should be able to, in principle, make a theory of these other universes as well. Uh, and maybe all these different possibilities that one sees in, say, string theory, uh, they just correspond to different types of consistent universes. Mm -hmm. They're not the ones in which we live, but from philosophical, theoretical point of view, there's nothing wrong with those universes. So in this sense, is a framework uh, a little bit like, uh, I don't know, quantum field theory would be a framework with a lot of consistency conditions that you have to impose, but yeah. you, know, you, have, you can have different models of reality choosing different field theories, and you can, it can be something similar with string theory, maybe with more constraints, a lot of more consistency requirements. But something similar. But okay, this is not something that I was planning to discuss, but since you brought it up, I mean, what do you think? Because I I hear from my friends, string theorists, uh, uh, both perspectives. I mean, sometimes uh, there is the, I know we are, we are after, we may not have it, but we are after a single unique theory that will be the theory of everything and will be uniquely selected among possibilities once we understand more. From other friends that I equally love, I mean, I have no particular prejudice or, or preference there, uh, from other friends, it's more like, uh, no, I mean, string theory is great because it's a rich framework within which then we start uh, constructing models or identifying what is the best description of our current uh, universe. W what's your take? I mean, you are in one side or the other, or you haven't decided? No, I think I'm, I'm a little bit in between because it's clear that string theory has um, different solutions that describe different universes. The, those can be written down explicitly, so there clearly are different solutions. Mm -hmm. But what is... Um, um, and, and But they are really different universes in the sense that they, they look very different. I mean, they don't even have the same number of dimensions, for example. They look different. Um, what seems to be true is that, um, is that strength theory does not have three parameters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have... Uh, like like a mass that you have to choose by hand and doesn't have three parameters per se. And that has to do with some deep properties of quantum gravity that would apply uh, not just in string theory, but more generally to any theory of quantum gravity. Uh, uh, so slight technical side comment for those who understand it. So this has to do with the fact that if you had a free parameter, then the theory would have a symmetry associated to shifting that parameter. Uh, and there is a general theorem that has to do with black holes that has nothing to do with string theory but has to do with black holes that tells you that there cannot be such symmetries in the theory of quantum gravity mm -hmm. so if there are no free parameters then you can ask ah, if you if you have no free parameters then how can you have all kinds of different universes and then the picture is a little bit that um you know that is like a landscape so imagine that we have like a, you know, a landscape with hills and valleys and so on. So the landscape looks like that. 
in principle, there are many different valleys where, and if you have like a little marble or a ball and you have this landscape of hills and valleys, this ball can lie, you know, any of the valleys. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, all these valleys, they will look different. You know, they're not the same valley. Uh, they might look very differently if you live there. Uh, and maybe all these different solutions are strings to you are a little bit like all these different valleys, but they're all parts of one single landscape. Um, but then the question is, you know, not so much is there like one string here, but the question is in which valley do we live? Mm -hmm. That might be a much more difficult question because we, it's very hard to technically control this landscape, uh, of solutions of the theory. But again, at the risk of going a little bit technical, then I'll retreat, but the, the point is, uh, but then this is a, a different scenario than the one in which you truly have, uh, a framework within which you build different theories uh, because it's a bit more like uh, you have a, a single theory but with many so many solutions and you have to uh, you have to find out which solution describes our world so it's um it, it's different than what i was saying so i take it back it's not like in quantum field theory that you know just a general well, theory of fields uh, and then i may add some... like a small nuance yeah it, it, no, it's, of course for example if you uh um this is like a landscape, but these would all be landscapes, say, of four-dimensional universes, but they would all have a slightly different mm -hmm. matter content. They would have different particles. Maybe there would be a different uh, cosmological constant, like, uh, you know, that's the vacuum energy of the universe. Uh, however, there might also be a few different landscapes that are really different in a much more fundamental way, because, for example, there might be a landscape of three-dimensional universes. There might be a landscape of four-dimensional universes. And there might be five-dimensional universes. Uh, so this would be more like these uh, quantum field theories that are very different from each other. Okay. No, but it's a bit of a... But if you roughly specify some, some crude features of your universe, for example, the number of dimensions and maybe what it looks like far away, uh, you know, is it is it a ball uh, or is it not a ball? Is it is it like a ball with a hole in it? Uh, once you specify a few simple things, then then what is left is this landscape. Uh, okay, I understand. The picture that one has but, to you right now. But do you expect that there is one single equation, simplifying, that uh, given some conditions, uh, for example, coming from observations, will tell you, look, uh, you know, you solve the theory and that's the vacuum, that's the landscape you're in, and that's the particular valley you're in. But there is a single set of... Uh, you know, uh, instructions uh, to, to identify the world. That may in principle be true, but I'm very doubtful that humans will ever be able to accomplish this because it might even be true that there is many, many landscapes that are very, that in this landscape, there are many valleys that are very similar, and we will never be able to distinguish the ones that are very similar from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so my, um, so maybe we, we should just try to uh, you know answer the in principle question can be established beyond reasonable doubt that we have this landscape with all the valleys and that there is in enough richdom of valleys there and whether we can then actually pinpoint the precise valley that we're in uh, this may not be something that we will ever be able to achieve okay uh, but the same would be for identifying uh, the underlying uh, equation. I mean, you're saying that, uh, you know, it may exist, but that is not necessarily what we should strive for. Uh, it may, yeah, it might be, it might be difficult and it might also um, not be, you know, uh, give us any new practical insight of some sort. So that's the limit of reductionism in a way. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think what what I have come to appreciate more myself over the last few years is that uh, we should not ignore the fact that we are part of the system that we observe. We are we the, the universe is not something that sits in a box on our table that we can do anything with that we like. We are part of the universe, and that puts in principle limitations on what we can see and measure and understand. Mm -hmm. I am very doubtful, even as a matter of principle, whether we, we will ever be able to fully understand the system of which we are just a subsystem. Uh, that's, uh, that's very profound, I have to say. I, and I can also tell you that uh, the same profound notion and intuition came up uh, uh, not just in my nightmares, but also in a lot of previous dialogues uh, that I had with, with other people, philosophers yeah. and physicists. So it seems to be something that either 
people at CLIA and they're working on it, or somehow they unexpectedly came to believe or to feel. And so I would say it must be true. I don't know why and how, but it, it feels true. It feels uh, important. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that even uh, for, uh, even in condensed matter physics, we have these systems um, that are what is called chaotic systems. And um, like the weather is like a chaotic system. I could say, and we predict the weather. Uh, so if you have this all, you know, this universal super equation, then in particular, you should be able to predict the weather. But the weather is is chaotic. You know, there's this famous thing that if a butterfly, you know, flaps its wings now, then maybe 10 days from now, there will be a hurricane on the other side of the earth. Fable <laughs> system. And what typically the, the picture that people have is that if you start with, you know, say two exact copies of planet Earth with exactly the same atmosphere and everything, and you make the smallest possible change in one of the two, and you then follow what happens in time, that the what they will do, it will rapidly start to uh, deviate from each other. That You know, the difference will grow exponentially in time. Uh, and that's the hallmark of a chaotic system. And, you know, you could always build a better supercomputer that is a thousand times more powerful than the previous one. And you can maybe predict the weather one day more into the future than you could before. But there's always a limitation. And even if you had a supercomputer the size of the universe, you would still not be able to predict the weather in a year from now. It just wouldn't be possible. Uh, if you cannot predict that, even with a supercomputer that fills the universe, then you really cannot predict it fundamentally, period. And so there are many simple chaotic systems where you can already do this exercise and where, in some sense, uh, it's almost meaningless to ask this question. And, and it's also meaningless to to then say that there is an, a, 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 how to say, um, a clear and useful sense in which uh, the equations that in principle you would put in the computer to predict the weather are the theory of the of the of the universe. I mean, it's you know, I, you, yeah, you could you could argue that those equations uh, capture some of the features, but the actual co the detailed chaotic nature is presumably a very complicated set of equations, not a simple, e I mean, it's, uh, you know, if you just have water in a bucket or something, you know, you have 10 to the 25 water molecules, the actual equations are given by a 10 to the 25 by 10 to the 25 complicated matrix. And then differential equations that involve humongous matrices, this I would describe, and, and this is still the simplification, because if you really look at more detail, you have all these. So there's just no way we will ever be able to solve that exactly. We got, we have in principle uh, maybe the equations available, but there's no way we can ever solve these equations in these and, situations. And so, in that sense, it would not give you much more understanding than what you get from a simplified model in which you said that you have just a few particles and these are the basic forces. Then once you understood that, you go to a different type of description. There's no point in now listing and describing all the particles in the universe with, with those equations. I mean, you could do it, but the only purpose of that would be to impress your yeah. friends. Yeah. So then the question is what you what is achievable and, and what not. And then, then sometimes you just might want to make in principle statements. But uh, to continue a little water analogy, you know, there's some things, uh, if you have water, there's some things that can be described as simple equations, say particular waves on the water. Uh, those are described by the equations of hydrodynamics, right? Those are a few simple equations and they describe the waves pretty well. Now, if you make the waves more and more violent, then at some point those equations are no longer applicable and um, you have to study things like turbulence and so on, right? Because it, it becomes a very complicated set of waves. Um, but what underlies all of this is an intrinsically chaotic system that is beyond computational control period. Mm -hmm. And I think gravity is like this. So gravity is a bit like this hydrodynamics. It is some, uh, some, it is some approximate description, uh, but the actual underlying fundamental microscopic theory is presumably a chaotic theory, uh, and therefore fundamentally outside our computational control. Yeah, just to complete this, I mean, to, to add some other aspect, in fact, uh, uh, gravity itself, uh, even though it is almost surely 
an approximate simplified description in a part, valid in a particular regime or something much more, uh, how to put it, interesting. And then uh, itself is in fact chaotic and, and uh, you know, it shows, uh, you know, chaotic behavior and turbulence. It's highly, how, how they say, nonlinear. So even this approximate description is itself... Uh, uh, it's just limitations, yeah, already. Yeah, oh, yeah. Already, so, okay. But uh, just to go back to string theory, be, um, where we started, uh, um, what is M-theory? Because the way I always understood it, or what is supposed to be M-theory, because the, the way I always understood it, uh, um, again, mostly from friends, uh, is uh, that it is supposed to be these underlying equations uh, that, uh, you know, that behind all our effective description of string theories, uh, then uh, that in principle will encode everything. Then indeed we can argue whether it would be the useful way of describing things, but in principle that's what the fundamental theory is. Uh, uh, wh where am I wrong? Yeah, well, um, you're not wrong. That, that's good. Here's a particular version of string theory. Okay. So try to explain a little bit. So a situation in physics that we can typically compute and understand uh, are systems that that uh, have interactions, but where the interactions between things are not too strong. Mm -hmm. For example, if I have you know two particles and then you approach each other, they can scatter off each other, uh, and then you can add a third particle and so on. But if these if the interactions between these particles are not too strong, then you can sort of systematically compute what happens when particles interact with each other or more complicated objects interact with each other. However, it's a general problem in physics that if the interactions become stronger and stronger, that our techniques uh, break down at some point uh, to do things. Because there is typically in many physical theories, there's a parameter, um, let's call it G. And then typically the simplest thing that we compute is some number. And then the next simplest thing that's a bit more complicated is some number times G. The next simplest thing that we compute is some other number times G squared, etc. Now, if G is very small, then all those more complicated things will become smaller and smaller. It's something that we call perturbation theory, and it will be a very good approximation. It is incredibly difficult to figure out what happens in general in physics if these interactions become stronger and stronger, because then what I just said is not a good approximation to anything anymore, and we have to really think of a new way to compute things. Mm -hmm. A standard example where this happens, for example, is in QCD, quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory that describes the quarks in nature. Um, it has a very strange feature that at uh, low energies, so if, you know, uh, here, like low temperatures, low energies, and so on, um, this theory also has like a parameter G, but this parameter G depends on the temperature if you want, and at low temperatures, it's very large. And as you make the system warmer and you go to higher temperatures, this parameter becomes smaller and smaller. So it's a strange theory where at, if you do, do, you know, scatter quarks at very high energies, we can compute reliably what happens, but at low temperatures, it's very difficult. And something very funny happens, uh, because at low temperatures, quarks show something is called confinement, which means that they no longer exist as individual particles, but they also have to be grouped together in a particular way. They are locked up in some way. And it is still a, a, an open question to give a mathematical satisfactory description of this phenomenon. Although the equations are known, it's a super simple equation, I'm sure you know it, for QCD. Uh, by the way, if you solve that, you can uh, get like a million dollars. It's one of the so-called clay problems that were announced in 2000. There were seven problems worth one million each. Uh, one has been solved by now, uh, but the other six are still open. Okay, so don't, don't run to do that. I mean, let's let's ask them to stay stick around for a while more. And uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, some people uh, just a bit of encouragement to this. <laughs> just some money here to be made. Um, Anyway, now strings, coming back to strings, so it's a bit of a long winding uh, road. And going back to strings, if you have strings, strings can also interact, like two loops can come together and continue as a single loop. They can merge. Uh, 
how likely it is that they will merge is again measured by some parameters, some number. It's called the string coupling constant, uh, typically also called uh, G or so. Uh, and if that number is small, then then these strings they do you know they sometimes interact a little bit, and then we can exactly as I was describing before we can do nice computations etc and things are under control but once these interactions become stronger and stronger and just like with quarks the picture of individual strings that sometimes scatter off each other becomes less and less good uh, now if you make this coupling constant the interactions between the strings very strong you can no longer have just a single free string because it will immediately interact with all kinds of other strings so there's no longer a good description in terms of three strings that just happily move through the universe and once in a while do a little interaction with another string. It's just not a good description anymore. Um, the best guess we have for a description that uh, sort of, so we should look for an alternative description uh, of strings in this regime. And uh, it's quite difficult to find the right description, but basically this thing called M theory is the theory that is supposed to describe strings in this regime where you can no longer distinguish them individually they always interact with each other and the fundamental degrees of freedom are no longer recognizable as strings and this is the thing called m theory so to so to summarize in, in different words to see if i understood this uh, so m theory is supposed to be the uh is supposed to be string theory in in those situations in which uh, you know the the best description of the theory itself is not in terms of moving strings uh, that uh, scatter around and propagate and do and vibrate and so on, in which the basic uh, entities, uh, well, cannot really be taken to be the string themselves, but something else. That, yeah, because they are because these strings interact so strongly with themselves that this is no longer a good description of the theory. Yeah, that's in correct. fact, maybe a general message that is it's important to stress is that. Uh, this is uh, in, in, indeed, as you as you pointed out already, mentioned in QCD. I mean, this is uh, ubiquitous in in in, in physics. I mean, uh, it is yeah. it is very uh, it's very rare that one can say I identified the, the fundamental entities uh, even of a particular system. It doesn't make so much sense. We can say that you know under certain circumstances, uh, the strength of the interactions uh, or the temperature or whatever else. Uh, well, then it's a very appropriate description of all the phenomena related to the system is in terms, I don't know, of uh, a fluid uh, over which we have little waves. In a, in a different situation for the same system, uh, well, a much better description yeah. would be a bunch of molecules uh, scattering around and having some chaotic uh, motion. And it's not that the system is different, it's just that uh, we, we are approaching this, the, the same system in, in, yeah. a, in a different no, context. That, that's indeed an, an important, but this is generic in physics, as you say. So even if we have like one equation that is supposed to be like the fundamental description of the system, depending on the situation that you're in, whatever things appear in your fundamental equation may not be a good practical description of the system. Uh, the practical description may well be in terms of all other entities that are so, so it's not a fundamental description. It's sometimes what we call an emergent description. Uh, because these degrees of freedom that we use to describe the system might be very different from our fundamental equation, but it's just, um, but those original things might be very strongly interacting and just not be good building blocks to describe an experiment. And any time you have things like phase transitions, uh, in nature, because you change the temperature or you change the density or so on, then typically place the building blocks that give us the best description change. Mm -hmm. Although the fundamental equation does not. So, the, so in, in this sense, uh, it's a, uh, I would feel like, I mean, this is more controversial, so you can, you can, you can disagree strongly, but I would suggest, I would like to dispel this picture of the scientist or the physicist in particular as the, what the guy who is searching for truth. I mean, the ultimate nature of reality. I mean, yeah, we, we do that in, 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 to some extent, but. We just try to understand a little bit more 
And the world is so extremely complex that the way we actually do it is to construct models that seems appropriate in different uh, situations. And then if we manage to unify them in the sense that we find we are good and lucky enough to find some overarching model that uh, indeed unifies different uh, previously distinct uh, description, then we are even happier. But in practice, uh, you know, we're not there. It's not that we keep digging uh, as if it, there was a single system. We just had to go deeper uh, into it. I mean, is that uh, and uh, being able to change a perspective, uh, change the type of models we use, uh, be imaginative in uh, what could be the relevant, uh, you know, tools uh, to describe different situations. It's uh, yeah. yeah. Now that's right. But for example, uh, um. It's still nice to have these like fundamental descriptions, although they might be unsolvable and impractical. Uh, it is ultimately, if you if you want to ask more and more complicated questions about the system, then eventually you need to resort to that original fundamental description in order to really solve the questions that you're interested in. Yeah, I work uh, on quantum gravity, so I'm not going to disagree with uh, any of that. So Yeah, no, but even, uh, uh, even if you want to do hydrodynamics and you want to, uh, you know, uh, you can, you know, these things have most liquids are viscous. They have some viscosity. Uh, you may want to try to see if there is a relation between the viscosity and some other properties of the fluid. And it might be true that if you go back to the fundamental description, you can derive such relations. Uh, also, if you want to derive what happens at a phase transition from first principles, then, you know, the description on one side is not good. The description on the other side is not so good because you're precisely in the middle. And then maybe to go back to the fundamental description. It says that the definition oh, of fundamental. Yeah, well, uh, that's exactly what we mean, right? That you yeah. know, it allows us to 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 put together and go beyond the two distinct ways of describing the system. Yeah. And and uh, it's just a more accurate description. Uh, in, mm -hmm. um, like as a colleague here in the astronomy department sometimes like to say uh, is uh, uh, in, in Dutch it rhymes and English it does not. So it doesn't sound as good, but it's it's some sort of thing that sound is something like, you know, uh, 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 theories come and theories go, uh, but <laughs> equations always remain. <laughs> and the reason is that good equations, they they are just good approximate descriptions. Uh, and even though the like the theoretical understanding of those equations might change, the equations themselves are excellent equations. Like f equals m times a is some approximate equation that many people know, and it's for, dates back to on. There's nothing fundamental per se about it, but it's an excellent equation to describe a large set of systems and situations that we encounter. So that equation will remain, although our fundamental understanding of where it came from has evolved over time. Not only, okay, yeah, I, I want to go back to strings, but uh, let, let me just add another comment because I, I think it's another important lesson uh, that uh, for, from, you know, if whoever looks at science from the outside, uh, the, that's a, an excellent example of a situation in which uh, not only the equation stays and remains valid in its domain of applicability, but it does so not only in a, a big, uh, in a situation in which our understanding improved and we can do much more and we know much more than when the equation was first uh, introduced. But even if our understanding of the very terms in the equations has changed a lot, I mean, the way we now understand forces and masses and, and so on is totally different than uh, 400 years ago. The equation is still good for whatever it was used. Uh, it is still perfectly good. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Somehow it means something totally different in a modern perspective, but we still use it exactly as the, it was used before in roughly the same situations. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, okay, let's go back to strings before leaving strings. Uh, yes. Suppose that uh, uh, this uh, this ex exciting unified picture of the world uh, for what we know and for what we don't uh, is, is valid. Uh, what are the lessons? I mean, if you can Tell me, you know, like one or two main lessons that we learned about, I don't know, space, time, the universe, I don't know, whatever. I mean, whatever aspects of uh, physics and, and reality that you would identify as, okay, assuming the validity of the framework, this is an amazing thing that must be true and is uh, worth uh, telling the world. Well, 
it's actually very hard to come up with um, with a prediction um, that is unique to string theory in that sense, or a, an absolute truth of the type that you're referring to. Because a, a lot of what is really nice is that uh, in many cases we have some general expectation that does not necessarily have anything to do with string theory, but it might just be based on just looking at black holes and how they behave. On. Uh, and and for example, uh, just just uh, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, I, just to clarify, uh, I don't necessarily mean predictions, uh, you know, of some effect, but you know, so it tells us something uh, radical about the world uh, that may or may not have immediate observational consequences or a precise number attached to it. But you know, something that it was not true in uh, in, in the previous framework, and it becomes true in string theory. Yes, I think string theory has really made the idea that that gravity um, is is very different from all other forces in nature, and that the fundamental degrees of of gravity are not local, mm -hmm. and that gravity is a, is a so called holographic theory. I think string theory has put that particular conceptual idea on a much firmer footing. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I need to explain briefly what those words mean, but uh, we can do in a second. But that, I think, is one of the main lessons that we got from string theory. Mm -hmm. I, I had in mind, uh, um, again, I'm, I don't work on string theory directly, but uh, I mean, I, I've studied it a little bit. And uh, as I said, I have many friends doing that, so the, we talk. Uh, yeah. But this uh, something that is not, again, specific to string theory but it's especially rich in string theory is is is, is for example dualities i mean uh, and 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 the point is that in string theory uh and again i'm not referring to holography that I will, uh, we will touch in a second probably but uh, the fact that i don't know the dimensionality of the world or the topology or the shape of the world uh, and and it's uh it's not Absolute. It's not a given. It, 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 it is itself part of the description you decide to adopt in a particular situation. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. pretty amazing. I don't know of any other theory in which that is so, you know, shouted at you. I mean, it's... it's, it's... No, it, it, uh, it's remarkable that that string theory, to the extent that we understand fully uh, all possible solutions of the theory, but that it seems to require. Uh, so certainly, if we have strings that 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 really uh, sort of are the right description. So they, they interact once in a while, but not too often. So you really can describe the theory in terms of strings. That particular formulation of string theory does require uh, several additional dimensions in our universe that are invisible to us right now. And those dimensions can have all kinds of shapes and forms. And um, those would, in principle, have observable consequences. So that's definitely uh, an interesting outcome of string theory which one had ordered or expected. Uh, and that's a very surprising thing that came out of string theory. So the, the fact that string theory naively is a theory that exists only in 10 or maybe 11 dimensions is a very strange observation and remarkable. It's like one of those things that, you know, no one ordered that, if you want to <laughs> know what I mean. Uh, it's like, why 10? Why 11? Uh, but it's an outcome of, uh, of, a, of a computation. Um, and yeah. It might be a feature and not a bug because it precisely gives a lot of extra room to make different four dimensional theories, depending on what you do with the remaining six or seven dimensions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you were introducing the 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 the, the, the topic of uh, you know predictions of uh, of effects and so on. It's clear that uh, being such a large framework is very hard to pinpoint something that is so uniquely selected as, as a prediction that you go to the next door to your cosmologist friends and say, look, this is the number you have to obtain when you when, when you do this particular observation in, in the sky. Uh, but uh, what would be your best guess of uh, where we will find uh, string related uh, effects? Uh, just a guess. I mean, I, yeah. No, well, my current, my current, uh, it's maybe not the most positive thing, but my current uh, understanding is that it's very unlikely we will see any mm -hmm. time soon. Uh, it's just those effects seem to be hidden very much from us. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there have been all kinds of uh, you know. There's always speculations about what you could see, and uh, but most of these make all, all kinds of additional assumptions that need not be made. 
uh, and if you are sort of kind of minimalistic, so so I, a, a, a different way, a, a different question you can ask is, can I think of a situation where you make some sort of measurement or do some experiment mm -hmm. where clearly something else must come out and what say general relativity would predict based on, and the answer to that question is that uh, anything that humans will ever be able to do uh, can be perfectly consistent with general relativity and not be in disagreement with string theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no, no net, you know, there's no strong conceptual reason to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to, in, to believe that there will be some experimental verification anytime soon or any obvious signature of string theory. Maybe the absence of weird quantum things and gravity is maybe almost evidence for string theory because it's compatible with that, it seems. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, you know, people, um, so one interesting thing, for example, that seems to come out of string theory, but has been proposed on different grounds by many other people is the existence of something like a shortest length scale in nature. Mm -hmm. um, the argument is in some sense simple because this theory of general relativity, uh, once you go to short and shorter distances, at some point, this theory can no longer be applicable because almost anything that you would do would be a black hole and so on. So it's just a weird theory. Um, in string theory, there's a strange statement that says that, um, that, um, well, the precise statement is that uh, a particular distance is is indistinguishable from uh, 10 to the minus 70 divided by the distance. Those two distances are experimentally uh, identical. Now, which we don't know in which one we are, and, and you never you know, combine both at the same time. So this is more like a philosophical statement than a practical statement. Mm -hmm. But the thing tells you that uh, this kind of shortest length scale, namely 10 to the minus 35 meters, which is like the Planck length. Now, so where the distance is, you could argue about, it could be a slightly different number, but there seems to be some short. Now, then you could say, well, let me now try to modify the theory on those distances. And there are many people that have attempted to do so. They put sometimes some discrete structure. There's people who, who, who um, try to take the so-called Heisenberg uncertainty relations from quantum mm -hmm. and impose an extra minimum length on those. But none of those things are really properly derived in, in their phenomenological approaches. And depending on the choices that you make there, you can or cannot get concrete experimental predictions. Like you might, for example, uh, uh, some deviation of the, you know, the relation between uh, frequency and, and wavelength of photons or something like that, depending on how you implement it in detail. Uh, but these are not string predictions because they, uh, you know, the shortest length scale is something that string theory knows about, but then if you want to technically implement it and you go back to string theory, it turns out to not have any obvious experimental implication. If, however, you add by hand additional phenomenological bits and pieces, then maybe some interesting observable phenomena would come out, but it's not really a prediction of string theory. It's a prediction of string theory plus da da da. I see. Let, let me, uh, indeed, this is a very important point. Uh, um, let me state why this is important from a, a different point of view. Uh, on the one hand, as you said, uh, string theory, but in fact, I would say most theories of quantum gravity, I know our general expectations about quantum gravity would suggest that there is some sort of minimal length in in the world that you cannot beyond which you cannot probe i mean so this is a, as the for example the radical consequence that our picture of the of space uh, as if it was a continuum with you know in which you can resolve points up to the infinitesimal distances cannot be true is some approximation on the other hand it's very problematic because if anybody knows about uh special relativity i mean uh, the, the the idea that there is some minimal length uh, really you know, goes against uh, the, the very notion of, uh, you know, relativistic invariance in a way, because we expect that if I start going uh, faster and faster, you know, I will, I will, there will be the phenomenon of contraction of lens. So for different observers who are moving at a different relative velocity, you know, one will see the same, the same length, uh, much, much smaller, the same object, much, much smaller than, than the other one. And okay, then you ask, uh, what happens if the difference in velocity is even bigger and the guy is going even faster relative to the other one? 
well, the same object will look even smaller. And there's no limit uh, to how small something is supposed to be uh, appearing. Uh, so the moment you try to introduce a, a minimal length in your theory, whatever it is, as well, you know, even if you are justified by all sorts of other principles, then you have a hard time making this compatible with the uh, relativistic invariance. And uh, so not only string theory seems to predict this type of minimal length, but seems to do it uh, in a framework that by some miracle, by some conspiracy of consistency conditions, uh, is uh, fully compatible with the relativistic invariance. And that's uh, so well, one can yeah, argue we whether... To, yeah, but we need to maybe be a bit careful by what we mean by relativistic invariance in this discussion. Um, uh, because in the curved space-time, Special relative is, um, is of course broken and so on, and one needs to be. But I think a general uh, a general phenomenon, for example, is that if you were to try to do as you just described, by the time you have two observers that have such a large relative velocity that these met, that they would start to see these small distances, the energies will also become very large and most likely so large that black holes start to form. Exactly. Of course, uh, that means that the geometry of space time also starts to change itself. And the question is, if you take that all into account, whether, uh, you know, there's still an observable effect remaining, or in fact, whether all these other physical phenomena completely wash away your attempt at seeing a small distance. You're right. That's exactly the non-trivial part that I was uh, sort of uh, he, uh, skimming over. I mean, to make uh, uh, the existence of a minimal length in a theory compatible with uh, relativistic invariance and uh, extended to curve space, you have to really be able to carefully put together the physics of the gravitational field, the deformation of space-time due to large uh, bumps of energies and uh, motion and uh, indeed the notion of distance and space-time and so on. This is the highly non-trivial part and, and any naive way of trying will end up failing and I, we know it ends up failing. Then it's one can debate uh, whether other approaches to quantum gravity do something as remarkable, but in any case it's clearly very difficult. And uh, It is. It is. And but it's true that, in, again, in general, in physics, if we have a theory uh, like general relativity, it's a theory that comes with what we call a length scale. There is like a dimension full constant in it, a Newton constant, so it has it has a length scale. Uh, any theory in, in physics that we know that has a length scale like that, we do not believe to be valid below that length scale, whether it's general relativity or any other quantum field theory. Uh, now, what happens below that length scale requires a more fundamental theory mm -hmm. um if you want so so in some sense special relativity is an approximation to general relativity and uh, general relativity has a length scale uh, so we should not believe the naive rules of special relativity uh should be you know scrutinized carefully as soon as we approach this length scale mm -hmm. any setting uh, this has nothing to do with string theory it's just a statement about uh, you know effective fields use in physics um, and then you have to think carefully what it means. And uh, in, in any case, you, you might believe that in, uh, in the gravitational theory, if the length scales become short and energy become large, the question is whether words like space and time and geometry are, are the right language. For example, if we go back to hydrodynamics, there is this smooth surface of the fluid. That's an excellent description of hydrodynamics. But as you make the system higher and higher energy, this, this surface becomes more and more turbulent. Uh, and maybe at some point, little drops will start to fly. At, at some point, there is no nice surface anymore, uh, especially when the water evaporates. Uh, you know, there's no nice. So, so it's just not the, the right way to describe the system. And in the gravitational theory, the question is, uh, if you go to very weird situations, whether uh, you know, the language that we use, time and space and so on, but that's, that may not be the right language. Let, let, okay. Most likely it's not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to move to, to, to holography because we, we touched it and it's a super interesting topic. Uh, but uh, given, I mean, I just want to stress that that's exactly how 
uh, that's exactly how I think about space time and uh, as emergent, uh, although I come from different uh, formalism. And the example, uh, the metaphor I always use to uh, is, is is a bit silly, but it's it's like uh, if uh, we are uh, like fishes uh, swimming in in water that uh, are looking for uh, the molecular theory of water, and uh, one thing that seems to be uh, true uh, or uh, reasonable is that indeed uh, there is a molecular theory and that there will be a regime in which our ordinary notion of uh, the fluid in which we swim uh, doesn't make any sense. And I, I don't know exactly how fishes uh, orient themselves, but whatever they are using will fail when the water evaporates. And yeah. uh, so anyway, so yeah, yeah. So, that that's one metaphor, and the other thing I wanted to say is is related to the the issue of uh, you know the minimal length and so on. I think you clarified very well why not only is uh, non trivial but also it's in in any case indicative that there is some you know new physics and and so on. I want to stress the fact that. Uh, if we are clever and we manage to implement the notion of a minimal length, that itself uh, in, in our frameworks, in our theories, that itself uh, is a potential source of a lot of new phenomenology. Now, that is true even if you do it in a, in a more naive way of breaking uh, Lorentz invariance or some other symmetries, that's okay. But even if, when you don't do that, that, since it's a new ingredient in, uh, in, uh, in our uh, description of the world, in itself comes with a lot of consequences. You have to modify a bunch of other aspects of uh, physical theories. And uh, people who do quantum gravity phenomenology in, in many different ways uh, are, are based their uh, simplified models uh, for phenomenology on the idea of the existence of yeah. minimal length and something stranger happening to symmetries and even if when they're not broken and there is a, a rich uh, door uh, of uh, phenomena. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and there are many uh, interesting ideas around how to implement it. Um, so string theory gives, gives uh, in principle, a computable implementation of some of that. Mm -hmm. And um, you can sort of see if you have a string, you know, you cannot make a string arbitrarily small. Because if you, if you, um, if you want to make something very small, then you need a large momentum and energy and so on. And that will start to uh, cause the string to vibrate. And it will then, the, the smaller you make it, the more it will vibrate. So you cannot just put a string in an arbitrary small box. Mm -hmm. so, so string theory has this built in. It's one particular implementation of this uh, minimum length idea that comes for free if you want in string theory. Mm -hmm. um, so in principle, you can compare some of the computations you do with other phenomenological approaches that in, input a minimal length and see what the differences and uh, similarities are. Um, our experience from um, effective field theory, uh, which is a general, um, you know, framework in physics, is that typically by the time you hit this length scale, um, a tweak of the theory is not the way to go. You need to typically invoke uh, a better theory if you want to go beyond on that length scale. Mm -hmm. uh, that's universally uh, what happens in, in effective field theories. Now, gravity is very weird and very different from other theories. Uh, but that seems to typically uh, be what happens in all of the known cases where you have this length scale and you hit like this cutoff in the theory. Good. So without further ado, let's let's move to holography. And I would I, I would like to mention you know to introduce uh, you know two different uh, concepts, a priori distinct but strongly you know strictly related. One is the general idea of holography that uh, you know was there in, in black hole physics it was suggested within black hole physics first. Uh, but again, it's it's much broader. And then there is, uh, you know, the 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 idea of uh, the idea CFT correspondence, which uh, you know you can take it as an independent thing. But of course, it's also a very concrete uh, and very rich uh, implementation of the idea, realization of the idea of uh, of holography. So can can we, can we say something about the two in in the order you prefer? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the original idea of holography is based on the observation, it's based on a series of, of, of um, observations. Um, but it, it seems to be telling us that somehow uh, gravitational theories have, have some sort of dimensional reduction phenomenon in terms of degrees of freedom. Um, because if we take any volume in space-time, any region, 
um, as we put more and more energy or information in it, at some point, this whole region will collapse to form a black hole. Because um, larger black holes have lower densities. Uh, they have some sort of density. So uh, I sometimes, you know, say, suppose I store information on, a, on USB sticks. Then you might think that the amount of information I can store somewhere in space time is proportional to the volume because I just put as many USB sticks as I have volume available, and that is how much information I can store. But the funny thing is that if you take an enormous warehouse of a few light years by a few light years by a few light years, and you stick the whole thing full with USB sticks, it will be so heavy that it will collapse into a black hole eventually. So there is a fundamental limitation that you that the amount of information you can store is not proportional to the volume, which is the case in, say, the standard model and in all non-gravitational field theories that we normally use. But once you turn on gravity, it's no longer proportional to the volume. It's fundamentally proportional to the area. Uh, and to get that, you have to think a bit about black holes. And that's because the more whatever you put in the black hole, if anything, is is something you can you know it affects uh, the data on the area, the, the surface. Yeah, it's, the it, 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 it grows. Uh, yeah, you can just do a, like a back of the envelope computation if you want, but it, it really grows in a way that's compatible with having the information in the system being proportional to the area, not to the volume. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's almost like uh, now in these all these other theories, like the standard model and quantum field theories that we that we always use, information is proportional to the volume. So it's almost like a, a, a gravitational theory secretly has one dimension less because it grows like the area and not like the volume. Mm -hmm. And this phenomenon that that it appears to have one essentially one dimension less as far as the amount of information goes. And accordingly, as far as the degrees of freedom go, this is a generic observation that is just based on black holes and it's called holography. Mm -hmm. uh, because in holography, we try to store information of three dimensional objects on a two dimensional image. Uh, and black holes seem to be doing precisely that. So it looks like black holes are telling us that anything that happens in a particular region of space time can be stored on the boundary of the region in a simple way, well, relatively simple way. Yeah, maybe, maybe to I, I I venture into a, into another uh, way of uh, of uh, trying to, do, to to explain this. I mean, what, what do we mean by having a certain amount of information? Well, information is you know a set of messages, and we encode them in the position of our I don't know letters or legal blocks, or you know we decide to have a code in which if I put a number of particles in a certain set of positions. Uh, then uh, that means something that that encodes a certain message, and then you can ask, okay, how much information, how how many possible configurations of a bunch of particles are there in a certain region, and you would expect that it has to do with the, the all the possible ways in which you can place your particles uh, in that region, and that goes yeah. with the volume. I mean, the bigger the region, the more possible configurations you have for those particles, so the more messages can be encoded there in a way and it's instead what seems to happening uh, with a uh, with a black hole is that uh, you know it, it's of, almost like uh, you can only write messages or put particles in different configurations but on the surface of, of the volume of the regional space occupied by the black hole and that's uh well it's a bit mysterious in fact and certainly surprising yeah now it, it's very surprising um but you can give many qualitative arguments that this seems to be the right picture. You can do all kinds of Gedanken experiments with black holes that seem to be uh, in agreement with this picture. So there's a fair amount of evidence for this picture. Yeah, but it's a it's a bit of faking it. I mean, we have to be sincere. I mean, we were surprised. Then, as usual, with as a community, as a physicist, oh, then yeah. uh, with hindsight, uh, then you can make up a lot of arguments of why that's something you could expect. Now that's that's true, but it's extremely surprising because it's very counterintuitive, and uh, it's something unique to a theory that's gravitational. Yeah. So, so in a sense, the holography come the idea of holography is uh, is that uh, you know what are the, I mean, um, if you ask uh, what is the dimensionality of your system, uh, it, somehow it has to do with uh, indeed uh, where is the information of your system. 
Uh, and uh, where where are the messages? What is the region of space in which you can put your messages about the system? The the, the statements yeah. about uh, the properties of the system. In the case of black holes, uh, although you are talking about a three dimensional region of space, uh, in fact uh, everything seems to be on a two dimensional uh, surface of it. And so yeah. it's a bit like uh, gravity is holographic in the sense that yeah, what looks like uh, a three dimensional world is really secretly a two-dimensional one, at least in some cases. Yeah. No, and uh, but exactly what. But this is uh, this is mostly based on counting degrees of freedom, if you wish, and so on. So the nature of this two. So suppose we take this picture seriously, then what would be the nature of this two-dimensional theory or surface, or how are these two-dimensional degrees of freedom? What do they look like? Mm -hmm. That's uh, much less clear from this, because for that you need to uh, come up with a, a somewhat more technical description of what's going on. And most of these computations uh, are, are based on uh, on counting. Mm -hmm. You just count degrees of freedom, you have no idea where they actually are. You just know how many there are. So this is mostly based on a counting argument. Good. And so where is what about ADS-CFT? Where is the holography there? Yeah, ADS-CFT uh, is... Um, based on the following, uh, well, my favorite way of sort of explaining ADS CFT is um, that the main problem in, in sort of really trying to attack quantum gravity is that there's nothing, you cannot grab the system. There's no reference point because suppose you have a geometry that fluctuates in the quantum theory of gravity, there's no fixed space time. So space and time they become kind of murky objects that fluctuate so how do you how can you talk about a point in something that doesn't really exist like in this manifold has a point here this manifold has so there's nothing you cannot grab it there's no like it's like a, <laughs> you don't even know where to start to describe it in some sense mm -hmm. um now one idea to try to have a situation where you can at least have a more precise description is to put gravity in a in some sort of box that has the property that those fluctuations that you put a boundary condition on the box in such a way that those fluctuations die out so that space time becomes more and more well defined as you approach the boundary of the box and is in fact well defined at the boundary. So now we have sort of a, a well defined reference frame that we can compare things to. Mm -hmm. uh, ADS CFT is a, is a technical implementation of this idea. So it, it uh, basically tells you what this box is. It's a particular space-time that's mm -hmm. called by the sitter space. Uh, it's a solution of the field equations with a negative cosmological constant. Mm -hmm. and, but it looks a bit like uh, like you put a potential in gravity that grows towards the boundary, and that means that if the you know things that fluctuate in the middle because you have this potential barrier, things kind of die out as you go towards the boundary, and at the boundary there's no fluctuation. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you can repeat these holography type of statements and, and in this case we have an actual boundary and in this case you could speculate that the actual degrees of freedom might as well live on the boundary based on this idea of holography um, and that would then suggest that this gravitational theory in this box could perhaps be identified with something that exclusively lives on the boundary of the box mm -hmm. which so is one dimension less which is one dimension less because it's a boundary and moreover, it's a bit more like an ordinary field theory because it no longer has a fluctuating geometry. So it looks a bit more like a standard model-like theory. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just say these words without, uh, you know, doing string theory or anything. You can just try to set this up. And there are many interesting thing computations that you can do uh, in, in general relativity in this case that all provide additional evidence that in this particular case, it really looks like there is a some sort of field theory living on the boundary of the box. Mm -hmm. um, and ADS-CFT is a very precise version of the statement where you can actually derive in string theory a much more precise statement where you say, well, uh, you know, uh, a theory of quantum gravity in this box in the following very specific technical setup is exactly identical to the following precisely defined quantum field theory that lives on the boundary of the box. That's that's the precise statement of ADS-CFT. But at a more heuristic level, uh, you, you can see many features already by just thinking about semi-classical gravity. 
For example, you can put this, uh, you, suppose you put a black hole in the middle of this box that has a certain, uh, you know, a certain area and a certain mass and black holes have a temperature. And, and you can now say, you know, the, uh, the degrees of freedom of this black hole, if I translate everything into variables that live on the boundary, what does it look like? And then it looks like it is just an ordinary statistical mechanical system as far as the entropy and so on go from the boundary point of view. It scales in the right way with the temperature and with the volume of the boundary. So it really behaves like statistical mechanics on the boundary. Um, and there are many other things that you can do without having a precise version of this correspondence mm -hmm. that all point in this direction. So let me let me let yeah. me interrupt briefly. So the the the, the two remarkable things are uh, not only that you have a, a concrete example in which indeed uh, you know for a gravitational system, as you said, very special is a particular set of conditions, but is a gravitational system potentially quantum gravitational system. So yeah. you put in also the all the conditions of a quantum system. Um, you can indeed uh, map uh, the degrees of freedom or uh, no, the information of the uh, system to fully on the boundary to live fully on the boundary of that uh, system moreover you have a uh, again with with some assumptions but you have a, a description of the dynamics the full uh, set of properties of those degrees of freedom in terms of a theory that only knows about the boundary so yeah. doesn't know that there exists uh, an additional dimension in space uh, that goes into the bulk uh, and it is an ordinary, uh, you know, field theory, quantum field theory, with, where there's no gravity, there's no gravitational force. Uh, yeah. So somehow gravity itself uh, seems to be uh, possible to map it into some other set of uh, properties that are not gravitational. Yeah. So this is an it's it's really an exact equality between a, a, like a four dimensional gravitational theory and a three-dimensional non-gravitational theory. That those two theories are identical to each other. Um, again, um, many of the uh, qualitative features of this statement you can derive by just putting gravity in this box and thinking about some semi-classical gravitational computations. But then string theory has a, a series of extremely precise examples where it says exactly what kind of gravitational theory there is, what kind of additional degrees of freedom, what kind of particles there are. And it says precisely also what the quantum field theory is that lives on the boundary of the box. And then there have been an incredible number of papers that have tested these statements in all kinds of situations. So the evidence um, for this equivalence in these precise string theoretic setups is quite compelling, I would say. So, okay, I, I want to then move to two consequences or two possible, you know, applications of, of this uh, ADS-CFT correspondence and more generally of holographic uh, behavior. Uh, and before I move there, however, I, I want to point out that uh, we mentioned earlier the notion of emergence of space and space-time and so on. And to some extent, this is exactly one, one example of that, because uh, the, if the correspondence is uh, indeed, as you said, exact, uh, then it means that there are statements uh, that you can make uh, which have to do with... Uh, you know, fields moving in a, in, a, in a certain dimension in space uh, that you can, uh, you know, mix together and translate uh, into statements about something that doesn't know about that dimension in space and lives in a lower dimensional system. So from that point of view, at least one spatial dimension is emergent uh, because you can reconstruct it from something which is not about space. Uh, yeah. And, and that's pretty remarkable in itself. But then I, I think that there is, I mean, you met, you you introduced it as if it was an exact equality, but I also heard statements that it could be an approximate equality or we have evidence of equality, but in specific regimes. And, uh, you know, it's not so obvious that, uh, you know, the equality holds uh, uh, really between two theories in any possible regime of the two theories. But is it, I mean, it's beside the point, it's just to... Yeah, no, I think that there are very good arguments that it's an exact statement that holds in all regimes. The question is, however, uh, if you claim that that A is is equal to B, but A and B look very different, that that's just like if you would say, uh, no, a duck is the same as an orange, <laughs> and 
they look very different. And clearly, uh, if you want to make a claim like that, it's rather remarkable. Now, uh, the reason why this can even happen has again to do, uh, so I go briefly back to something we discussed earlier, which had to do with the fact that if you have things that interact a little bit, then these build blocks are a good description. But if you have things that interact very strongly, then you don't really know what a good description is. So what happens in, in this ADS-CFT is that these gravitational degrees of freedom, they interact weakly. So that is a good description of the theory uh, in terms of weakly fluctuating space-time. The quantum field theory that is equivalent to that mm -hmm. is naively made out of things that look like photons and that look like quarks and so on. However, it's an incredibly strongly interacting theory. So those are actually not a good description of the theory. Uh, and apparently, remarkably, the best description of that theory is in some is with some auxiliary gravitational system in one dimension higher. So is it is it a bit like saying that uh, you know we we know that the very notion of an apple is uh, is an approximation. We know that the very no notion of an orange is an approximation. But yeah. so far we know that whenever the notion of orange is good uh, you know we compute properties and it matches the properties of uh, the apple in the approximation which we have under control more or less what we mean by an apple and it's hard to go beyond uh, these approximations but so far we haven't found a reason why the matching of the two will not work and it, is this reasonable <laughs> well we can derive that these two things are equal to each other. So there is some derivation from string theory. Mm -hmm. um, that seems perfectly fine. Uh, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. So sometimes there are things that, although the theory is very complicated, you can still compute and compare. So there's a lot of indirect uh, and direct evidence for it. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, yeah, it's it's really well, uh, well motivated and, and well supported by now. As far as, like some people, insist that it's a conjecture because it has not been proven. And so they insist on always calling this a conjecture. Uh, but I would say that by physics standards, it has been proven. Like, but... no, and in physics, we never prove things mathematically. You know, you can try to translate things into a mathematically rigorously well-defined problem, but we don't even have a precise mathematical, uh, you know, definition of the ingredients that go into this. So by physics standards, I would say it has kind of been proving. And uh, and to prove it in a mathematical rigorous way, uh, it, like most things, yeah, of course. it's just not uh, realistic. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but but from my point of view, the question doesn't have to do with so much with the. Um, so what I wanted to 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 understand, I still want to understand independently from our conversation, is not so much about how rigorous is the correspondence, but uh, uh, whether it is indeed uh, an equality between theories. To be proven with the level of rigor of theoretical physics, yeah, but, uh, it's really an equality, or is an approximate equality again with the level of rigor of uh, theoretical yeah, yeah, physics? Yeah, yeah, No, I would say uh, that that it's an equality would be my claim. Yeah, it's really an equality. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And um, okay, so let's move on to two consequences, and and uh, uh, so one is another correspondence that uh, I, I I really want to talk uh, to discuss with you because you worked a lot of the interface between you know gravitational physics, uh, classical and quantum, and quantum information and condensed matter and quantum many body systems, and it's the so-called entanglement geometry correspondence, which as far as I understand, uh, is um, so it's something that I also uh, I also work on in a different context. But as far as I understand, it's, it's very much explored exactly in this ADS CFT uh, context. So yeah. can, can you briefly say what what the correspondence is supposed to be and why is it interesting or exciting? Yeah, I should say there there is currently no precise statement of an entanglement geometry correspondence, as far as I know. Uh, what we do know is that in ADS CFT. Uh, so we should maybe so so entanglement is is the thing that distinguishes quantum physics from classical physics, and quantum entanglement refers to the phenomenon that if you have uh, uh, if you make different observa if you make observations at different places at the same time, uh, that the outcomes of those observations are correlated. For example, uh, suppose that I have a dice here and you have a dice and we throw it at exactly the same moment. 
then in classical physics, it is impossible that those two, uh, you know, phenomena or have any relations thing to any relationship with each other. And uh, because it takes some time to communicate what happens here to you, it's not a lot of time, but it takes some time. So if you would do it at exactly the same time, there could not be any relation between the outcomes. But in quantum mechanics, if you do a similar thing, it can happen that quantum mechanics predicts that whenever I get a one, you get a one, when I get a two, you get a two, etc. So that's really something very quantum. Yeah, to, sorry, to, to make sure that it uh, is clear, yeah. I mean, the two dyes uh, have to have somehow interacted in the past. That uh, should be in a, in, in, not, if I take two to totally independent dyes, so that there may be not. Well, not they, the, have, they must they have, have interacted in the past, but the type yeah. of interaction uh, that exactly. creates this phenomenon is, is, is totally quantum and it's called quantum entanglement. Yeah, exactly. And that, uh, that, that's the amazing thing that, you know, they may have interacted in the past, yeah. but then they can have forgotten about each other, so to speak. They, they really go to different uh, places in the universe and then we do measure and we find the correlation that yeah. you saw. Yeah. Now, now, one way, so this is very vague what I'm saying, now, one way in which these correlations could happen is if uh, somehow these processes of measuring these dyes temporarily opens up like a little bridge in space-time that connects the two events, like a little shortcut, like a little wormhole or something like that. Uh, if that were true, then any uh, correlated measurement or that has to do with entanglement could be related to some geometric phenomenon in the form of like a very tiny little bridge in space-time that connects the events. Now that is incredibly imprecise and super vague. Uh, but so so I uh, I don't want to make it more than it is because it's really nothing. But this is a cartoon um, which can be made a bit more precise in the sense that if you have not just a little bit of entanglement, but as you create more and more and more and more entanglement, we have situations where it seems to correspond geometrically really to a geometric connection between the two things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's something that's sometimes called the ER equals EPR model. Um, so, but it's uh, I think the image froze for a second. So, so the um, uh, but the precise mathematical statement is 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 not available. And saying that some entangled information corresponds to some very quantum geometry wormhole thing is 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 almost like an empty statement, if you ask me. Because what is this other thing? It's just some some words. Now. What is remarkable in this AJCFT correspondence is that um, there you can see that um, in this in this theory, this field theory on the boundary, it has all kinds of entanglement structures in it. Uh, you can just ask, how are the degrees of freedom that live here? How are they quantum entangled with degrees of freedom that live over here? And mm -hmm. even if you're in the ground state of a theory, so a zero temperature, you might think that uh, clearly there's no structure, but the vacuum even has such a structure. Uh, so different pieces of, of space have, have this entangled structure. Um, but it turns out that that is, in AJCFT, that is geometrized from this gravitational point of view. So there's a very precise equation that relates areas of surfaces in the gravitational description to the amount of entanglement in the field theory. So you do see that um, entanglement gets geometrized and it is simply the area of a surface. So it's another example it's... of a strange, unexpected correspondence between, uh, you know, you know, a, a, a type of phenomenon in this case, uh, quantum entanglement, that can be apparently equivalently described in terms of properties of space or you know, geometry, yeah. geometric properties. And it's but it's it's really strange in the sense that I think that is the most quantum thing ever, namely quantum entanglement. You know, things don't get more quantum than entanglement. So it's the most quantum thing on one side gets mapped to the most non-quantum thing on the other side, namely just the area of something, which yeah, how much more classical can you get than computing the area of something? And so this has something to do with the remarkable uh, way how, how, how this whole correspondence has been, uh, yeah, is, is organized. And, and if I can suggest, okay, is, I think that becomes a little bit, uh, I don't want to say more natural or less surprising, but if you have already accepted, uh, at least as a possibility, the idea that uh, the very notion of space and time and geometry are themselves emergent, 
then it's a little bit more uh, acceptable that, uh, you know, okay, they are going to be replaced by something else. This something else is going to be quantum uh, or could be, I mean, that's a natural assumption. Then you're going to compute uh, entanglement properties of whatever is down there, you know, more fundamental than space and time. And indeed, uh, you can translate uh, quantum properties, some quantum properties uh, of uh, whatever is there as a more fundamental entity into the notion of some notions of space and time, because you, is, to some extent is what you should expect, that uh, yeah, yeah. you reconstruct oh, yeah. them from something else. I mean, the precise correspondence that has been found is indeed very surprising. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now I agree that that something like this should happen is one thing, but that it is this <laughs> to make it happen. Is... Quantum property of entanglement gets mapped to sort of the most basic geometric building block is remarkable. So, and it turns out that uh, with more effort, you can find that there are many, many other uh, ingredients from uh, quantum physics and from quantum information here have interesting counterparts in general relativity. That's, uh, okay, so, that will lead us uh, f further away. I want to yeah, touch um, on, on, on the last uh, point. Yeah, let me just say yeah, yeah, one last sentence. And then sure. that people to suggest that maybe all of general relativity and all of gravity can be reformulated in purely information theoretic terms. So maybe information is ultimately the language of nature. Now, that sounds fascinating. Uh, it doesn't really be you believe made. that hmm? you believe that because i kind of do although i would not uh, bet too much money on, uh, on, on um, it, but i am i'm well inclined so to speak yeah i'm i'm uh, it's, it's 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 more important than most people think but i don't think it's the ultimate language personally but yeah that's okay cool um okay and uh, another it's not a consequence of ADSFT and holography, but another area of, uh, you know, another domain of puzzles in, in physics uh, have to do with the black hole and their evolution. Uh, and the perspective that a lot of people have about this puzzle, the evolution of black holes and, and, and the uh, so-called uh, information paradox related to black holes has been indeed uh, strongly influenced by the lessons from ADS-CFT. So much that a lot of people think that, you know, within ADS-CFT, there is a clear resolution of the paradox. And uh, so the paradox, I mean, I, let me just... Uh, Put it very very briefly and then uh, you can add whatever you like and then you tell me your solution uh the the fact is that uh, for reasons which are to some extent still a little bit mysterious uh black holes uh, uh okay we are they are peculiar in many ways already but they also seem to be thermal objects they seem to have all sorts of thermodynamic properties you can talk about the temperature of a black hole you can talk of the entropy of a black hole even though they're just regions of space in peculiar but they're just regions of space out there in the sky and um, in particular they have a temperature because you can you can show uh, in some approximation that they evaporate away so they radiate uh, they glow in the dark and they, they emit stuff which in generativity it's this is just impossible. When you start combining it to some extent in some approximation with principles of quantum physics, this seems to be a very general consequence that they radiate away. Yeah. When they radiate, they lose uh, content, they lose mass, they lose energy and so on. And if you keep following this evolution, uh, they, they are supposed to shrink, shrink more, and, and then we don't know what happens uh, and and it, it's a bit paradoxical because if what happens is that they just evaporate away then whatever you know stuff we put inside the black hole whatever formed the, the black hole is supposed to have evaporated away in particular any information content that was in in, in that stuff uh, and, and this idea that uh, information evaporates away or is lost uh, is contrary to basic principles in usual quantum mechanics if you work with quantum gravity and you try to develop a theory of quantum space, time, and so on, you are you expect that you have to drop some principles of your fundamental theories. But this one is a particularly crucial one, that things do not lose information, do not evaporate away as such. Um, so that's the information paradox in the context of black hole uh, physics. And uh, 
something has to go in order to explain what really goes on and we don't know exactly what which basic principle should go if we don't want to drop this uh, no loss of information principle yeah 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 well um the current understanding based on uh, these analysis that have been done in the context of ads cfc is that uh, information is not lost in the sense that in if you have a, in, um, a precise ADS CFT correspondence, this CF the, the same process translated into this boundary is is in the boundary is kind of similar. You you throw some stuff together, it forms some sort of warm ball of stuff in this field theory, which is the description of the black hole. But then from the boundary point of view, it's also some hot object. It's thermodynamic. It has some entropy in the temperature. And then also in, in this boundary theory, it will start to evaporate. Mm -hmm. But that's ordinary quantum field theory. Uh, so there's no issue with information loss. It's just a unitary process. Mm -hmm. so but the question then is, um, so there have been all these papers that precisely point out that if you put some basic physical principles together, information must be lost. Uh, and then you can ask which of those principles is the one that we should abandon. Um, and the principle that we should abandon is something called locality, but only in a very, very, very mild way, because you just need to, you need to let it go ever so slightly, just enough to make sure that the information comes out okay, but it will not have any other impact on any other experiment or observation that you do. Um, the thing is, if you, if you put information in a black hole and it radiates, then you get a bunch of radiation. And you could measure a few particles in that radiation, but that will you know, not have much information in it. And you can do a bit of a computation that the, you need to measure an enormous number of particles super accurately mm -hmm. to actually extract the information from the radiation. Now, in principle, maybe that might be, it's very complicated. And the device that you would be building would be very complicated and it would automatically in particular back react on space time because you cannot do it with a simple measurement. Um, and then you would in fact find like a deviation from uh, your prediction. Uh, but it's, it's not in contradiction because your device is so complicated. Or state, state it slightly differently. If you, if you have a, a theory like general relativity and you do a computation in that theory, um, then we trust the computation, but we were talking about a length scale. And if you go below that length scale, we do not trust computations anymore. But in general, in effective field theories, there's another place where we do not trust the theory anymore. And that is when we compute uh, what is called correlation functions with a large number of operators in them. Because that gives you an extra large number that can sort destroy the validity of the theory. And in this Hawking radiation, you precisely, the types of computations you need to do to get the information out involves so many operators that it invalidates the theory to begin with. And that's a much more general, uh, if you wish, effective field theory argument that that kind of, uh, uh, you know, also explains that you just, the information comes out but if you want to do the computation, you need a better formulation than general relativity because general relativity precisely breaks down for those computations that you would need to do to get the information out. So uh, let me let me say, so on the one hand, uh, it seems that uh, this points uh, to, 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 I mean, somehow is, I interpret it as saying that uh, the paradox was there because you were assuming a certain the validity of a certain description of space time and gravity of and what a black hole is that simply evaporates away but stays more or less the yeah. same type of object and space time itself uh, can still be described in the usual language for the whole history of the of this evolution well yeah. you shouldn't trust that theory in in this type of description it's uh, it, it will break down and it's from this type of breakdown that uh, you know you you can hope to recover the the information or yeah exactly so, so it's it, it's a, it's a breakdown in a in a in a situ it's not the normal breakdown that is associated with high energies but it's a different type of breakdown of the theory that's associated with very complicated observables in the theory um and 
those observables typically are not accessible to any reasonable experiment. So simpler, so it's not inconsistent to have a situation that all simpler observables perfectly agree with Hawking's computation, if you wish, uh, but precisely these very complicated ones that you need to consider to get information out are precisely in the regime where the theory is no longer applicable. Uh, and would you say that this uh... is like the smallest possible modification of the theory that sort of barely gets you out of your wish? Yeah. Would you say that this uh, suggests at least that uh, space time itself should be understood as a sort of a collective uh, phenomenon with, you know, with or whatever are the underlying degrees of freedom? Because, uh, you know, when you say is locality the problem, I mean, we tie again to what we said earlier that, you know, yeah. from other indications, from other corners of physics and quantum gravity and various other approaches and, and uh, ideas, we, we, we are told, uh, look, uh, the notion of space-time is an approximation in itself, uh, and, and the notion of space-time is built on the notion of locality, that you have points and things interact at a point. So from that point of view, you would have immediately, uh, you know, imagined that the, the, the thing that fails is the notion of locality. And, uh, so to some extent, it again is one other instance of a very radical counterintuitive yeah. notion that if you have accepted another counterintuitive notion becomes less uh, surprising or less. Uh... But yeah, it's true. So one based on these very general arguments that you just made, you might have expected that locality is somehow uh, the more problematic thing because if space-time fluctuates, what does it even mean, locality? Uh, on the other hand, if you... Uh, you cannot just arbitrarily fool around with locality and, and not be in contradiction with experiments. So it turns out the the, the way it's um, it's violated is is small and subtle and has really very little astrophysical implications. Otherwise, it is just sort of the minimal little bit of the locality that you need in order to make sure information comes out. Uh, but that has no other, as far as we know, no other observable consequences that uh, we care about. So, so the, the remarkable thing once more is that we have a very concrete, uh, highly constrained and precise implementation of the idea, not just yeah. that, you know, we have a model of, of, of a toy model of the idea. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's much more than that. Yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, one last thing, and then, uh, then, uh, then, then, then we go. Just because it, it yeah. came to mind. So the logic uh, of the resolution of the paradox. Uh, uh, in the context of ADS-CFT, uh, to me, seems to be like, uh, okay, let's imagine I have a black hole in ADS. Then I know under the assumption that there is indeed this uh, exact uh, correspondence that, okay, I don't know exactly what happens to all the degrees of freedom that make up the black hole, the space time and so on. But whatever they are, whatever they do, there will be a process uh, in, the, in the field theory on the boundary that is not gravitational. There's no gravity there. There's no black hole. It's a standard uh, quantum mechanical theory. And there again, I may not know exactly what translates into what, uh, but the evolution is going to be unitary, period. There's no, there's no way around it. Yeah. The, the doubt that I always have when I hear, I mean, the argument is super compelling, of course, and I'm fine with accepting that there is an exact correspondence and so on. That seems uh, solid enough to accept it. But we also have black holes in different space times, so yeah. like ES yeah. or something else. There, we just cannot run the argument. So what does it mean that in those cases, the information is lost or that in those cases, we have to be, we have to find some other argument? Well, um, in principle, um, there is no precise argument like this in any other asymptotically space-time, not in flat space, not in the sitter, and so on. It's, it only works in this very specific context. You, you might think that um, the, the abstract mechanism that a version of that could apply in these other situations as well. Mm -hmm. So the breakdown of, I think the, the, the fact that you have this breakdown of effective field theory for very complicated observables, I think is generically true in any field, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the background and so on, to, to, to find a compelling proof that uh, black hole evaporation is unitary in other situations will require a different setup. Mm -hmm. So I think the general um breakdown mechanism uh, can be uh, is seems robust and universal there's no reason to believe it would not apply in other situations but if you want to do a more de detailed computation where you say i make something i let it evaporate and i'm going to show 
that the entropy of the final state is zero, so that you know you really have a pure state and not some mixed state. Uh, for that, we lack right now the understanding of precisely how to do these computations in other space times. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, Jan, we we, we spoke about uh, emergence of space time and uh, yeah. black hole evaporation, information recovery. And uh, uh, and then what else? Uh, the holo holography and strings and unification. Uh, it, it it should be enough, not to, to to give food for thought. To, to... I think there was a lot of things. There's still a lot of things to do. I think exactly. Uh, if you look to the future, I think we still would like to have more precise and a more precise understanding of quantum gravity in other universes and more precise models of of those and see if mm -hmm. we can progress on that that's clearly an active field of research i think that even in the context of uh, for example black hole physics even in the context of ads cft mm -hmm. um there's one thing that is still in my opinion a bit unsatisfactory and that has to do with the fate of the infalling observer because in this dictionary between um and this has this is an almost an observational question, but suppose that you have some matter and you collapse it into a black hole, and now you take your spaceship and you fly in, then the prediction of general relativity is that you see nothing special as you cross the horizon of the black hole. Uh, but to to show that uh, to, is is remarkably complicated. You know, there have been some people that have been suggesting his, in the past that um, no, if you cross the horizon, there will be something called a firewall. It will be a mm -hmm at a place because blah, blah, blah. I think those arguments have mostly been dispelled, but I don't think there is a very precise computation. Mm -hmm. This AUCFT context, even in the AUCFT context of uh, what exactly the experience of the info server. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, part of, of the... Um... So, which is... Uh, so... Can, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Which is uh, to some extent is also what what uh, you you would care about uh, uh, because it has to do with the local, uh, you know, with the you know op more operational way of understanding what's going on. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. System. Very good. Okay. Anyway, no, that's uh, that's that's even more things to 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 think about and uh, and uh, probably more exciting surprises to 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 expect. But uh, for now, I well, I thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you. That was, uh, we could have uh, kept on the talking for a few more hours, I imagine, but uh, yeah, I think but we're, we're going to cross each other at least. So at least the two of us will be able to talk more uh, at, at some other point uh, uh, soon. And with the yeah. others, uh, well, thank you for listening and hope thanks. you enjoyed it. Thanks, uh, Jan. Thanks all for listening and um, until next time. Thanks, Daniel. Bye. Bye.